Amen. Encounter Church. Come on, can we make some noise for Jesus? Come on, let's stand to our feet. Amen. Amen. Let's make some noise for Jesus all over this place. Come on, guys. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise. Amen. All over this place. Um, my name is Anthony. I lead the youth and young adults here at the Encounter Church. And I want to welcome you. If this is your first time here, I want to let you know, welcome home. You are not only a stranger, you're not just a friend, but you are family here of the kingdom of God here at the Encounter Church. And we want to welcome you on behalf of our amazing pastors, Pastor Jeremy and Pastor Ruth. So welcome home. Can we make some noise? If this is your first time here, come on, guys, let's wake up this morning. Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. We got to rejoice. Amen. Um, but in all of that, uh, we want to welcome you as well and uh, just give you some announcements throughout the week. Um, if you have social media, we want to encourage you to follow us on uh, Facebook, follow us on Instagram, follow us on YouTube. Guys, Moving Mountains. Come on, how many know that this series has been, has been uh, encouraging, amen, has been motivating, has been powerful um, spiritually? And Moving Mountains has been great. So if you missed any of the series by Pastor Lorenzo, we want to encourage you to go back on the, on the YouTube at the Encounter Church and you can look back the past sermons and take some notes and get that um, for the announcements as well. But yes, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram so you can stay connected. Amen. Um, and also, we want to encourage you throughout the week. We got Tuesday's Bible studies. Come on, how many of you are encouraged by Tuesday Bible studies? Amen. You guys woke this morning? If you guys are not awake this morning, I want to encourage you. We got our outpour coffee as well. So go get a coffee. Go get a You got to wake up this morning, guys. This is for the kingdom of God, for Jesus. Amen. So get a coffee as well. If you need to wake up, you need that extra espresso shot if you haven't already. But, um, but yeah, so yes, we uh, Bible studies on Tuesdays have been such a great. Uh, Pastor Jeremy and Pastor Ruth were going over relationships. And it was just amazing, guys. If you're married or, you know, in a couple or, or anything like that or trying to figure out a relationship with Christ, guys, this is why it's important to get into these studies. So I encourage you to come on Tuesday nights. Also, everybody say prayer. Come on, say it like you mean it. Prayer. We have prayer on Wednesdays at 5 in the morning to 9 o'clock here at the Encounter Church. But we also got prayer for Thursdays at 7 p.m. at night. So if you're a prayer warrior, if you want to pray for your family, and come on, how many know our city needs prayer, guys? Come on. If we want God to move, he tells us to, to pray, to humble ourselves and pray. So we got to believe in prayer. Amen? So I encourage you on Wednesdays and Thursdays to come and let's pray together in unity, right? Let's pray over our city. Let's pray over the police. Let's pray over our leaders. And let's pray over our people here on the east side of Salinas, the four corners of every city, because we believe that prayer moves mountains. Amen? And also, everybody say tribes. Come on, say it. Tribes. If you're not in a tribe, then I encourage you right now, we need to do family together. So we have tribes on Wednesdays. Um, Lorenzo and Anna, Pastor Lorenzo and Anna lead that. If you guys are in the house, raise your hand. Amen. Pastor Lorenzo, they got a tribe, so I encourage you to connect with them and get in a tribe. And we also got tribes on Thursdays as well. Um, for the Encounter Youth and the Encounter Young Adults, we're doing something new as well. We're doing something called groups. Everybody say groups. So we're going to have, for the men and women, we're going to have our first groups tomorrow. The men are going to be with the men. There you go. Make some noise. And the women are going to be with the women. So if you're a young adult or you're like, yeah, you know what? I'm still kind of young. I want to connect with you after. And we're going to go there. We're going to get you in the group because we believe in doing life together here at the Encounter Church. Amen. So everybody say generosity. Um, before I came up to here, one of my favorite scriptures is in Mark, and it talks about a widow. And it talks about how Jesus is sitting in the church, right? Because generosity is completely important. Not out of my words, but Jesus spoke a lot about money. But he's sitting there in the church, and he's noticing that a lot of the people are giving, right? Leaders, leaders and, and religious people, they're giving out of their wealth. But this is what's powerful. He looks back, and he sees this young or this widow woman. And she's walking up to the plate, and the Bible says that she gives these two mites, literally less than a penny. And the Bible says that because she gave out of all she had, she gave more than the ones who gave out of their wealth. What I'm trying to tell you, it's not about how much you give, but it's the willingness that God, this is all I got but only I can give so far. But when I put my giving, come on, in the hands that can multiply, in the hands who can expand, come on somebody. That is what God looks for. He's not encouraged by how much, but he's encouraged by how much you're willing to with a cherished heart. So I want to encourage you in generosity. Um, we got five ways to give here, at the, or four ways to give. 
can give to the address above the screen. Uh, we also have, uh, if you could give on TECCentralCoast.org as well, you can also give there. Usually they put it on the screen, but you know, they'll put it on there soon. But th there's ways to give there on the Tidely app as well, amen. Are you guys ready to get, are you guys ready for service this morning? Amen. So this is what I want you to do. I want everybody right now just to lift your hands. We're going to pray real quick. Lift your hands. And those who are watching online, I believe the Spirit of God is going to move today, guys. I believe God is just going to move. And it's up to us if we want to receive that this morning. So right now, Father, we come before you, Jesus, God. Before the worship team gets on here, the atmosphere is already created, Father. But I pray, Father, right now, Lord Jesus, God, that your spirit will enter our hearts, God. And that, Father God, we will give you the very praise that you deserve, God. So right now, Jesus, God, we lift up everything, Father, for those who are coming and those who are going. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, come on. If you believe God is for you, come on, can we make some noise all over this place? Come on, make some noise all over this place. somebody can we just greet our neighbor really quickly wherever you're at just take the time just greet your neighbor just tell them what's up give him a handshake whatever you're comfortable with Do 
what you want payment for what you want payment for make way through the water walk me through the fire do what you want payment for what you want payment for shut the mouth of lions bring dry bones to life and do what you want payment for what you want payment God of exceedingly, God of abundantly, more than we ask or think, your word has never failed, your name is powerful, your word's unstoppable, all things are possible in you, God of exceedingly, God of abundantly, more than we ask or think, your will will never fail. Your name is powerful, your words unstoppable. All things are possible in you. The water, walk me through the fire. Do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Shut the mouth of lions, bring dry bones to life, and do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Let's bring through the water, walk me through the fire, do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Shut the mouth of lions, bring dry bones to life, and do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Make way through the water, walk me through the fire. Do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Shut the mouth of lions, bring dry bones to life. And do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Come on, somebody who is excited to be in the house of God this morning. Come on, I believe that I serve a God who does miracles time and time again, over and over. So I believe right now, if you have something in this room that you walked in with, you don't have to walk out the same way that you walked in. Come on. So if you believe with me, I want you to sing this part with all your life. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh, oh. I'm seeing you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move. You move the mountains, and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way Come on. when there was no way. So I believe I see you do it again. Yeah, I've seen you move. You move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it again. of worship right now you know there's so much going on in this world and so much that we don't have control over but the one thing that we can do is, is worship our God you know and he's the only one that can 
that can help this what, what's going on right now in this world so right now just everyone just raise your hand and just give everything to him
fail me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me. Yeah. You know, think about this song. I love this song so much because it's a declaration of that God will do it again and again. And there's been so many times in my life where I needed my old school faith. So many times in my life where I just needed to remember that if God did it before, he'll do it again. It may be a new situation, but I serve the same God yesterday, today, and forever. So it doesn't matter what new challenges come my way. Doesn't matter what new obstacles come in my face. I know I serve a God that does it again and again. And he'll do it for you because he did it for me. Come on. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe. Come on. I'll see you do it again. You made your move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. He made a way. Come on, when there was no way. No way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me. Promise still stands. Come on, can we all sing that out? Come on, if you believe he's never failed, come on. Yes. And he never will, come on. Everybody, let's just lift our hands. You know, I see so much joy today. I see so much love for Christ today. And that really motivates me. It gets me so excited. Because I want to share something with you. Over the last few weeks, Associate Pastor has been speaking about moving mountains. And when you want to move mountains... The devil's always right behind you. He's always trying to put things in your thoughts. He's always trying to put those obstacles in your place, right? Because he knows, he knows that when you get up, when you speak the name and you declare the name of Jesus, he ain't got nowhere to go, okay? So one thing is, today I came with the intention of calling the devil out. All week, all week, he's been giving me nightmares. He's been flinging me across my back. He's been shutting doors in front of my face. 
And I said, no, not today, Satan. This is not your day. You are not claiming this territory. You're not claiming the peace that God has already given me. You're not taking my family. You're not taking my husband. You're not taking my kids. You're not taking my church. Because the encounter church is ready to fight, ready to move forward. There is no, no truth in the devil. The father of all life. So today, I want everybody to just raise your hands and declare. Josh said, we're going to make a declaration. So today, we are going to declare victory over our circumstances. Today, we are going to allow Jesus to fill us through and through. Some of us cannot be filled because our previous pain a hole in our soul. So how can we accept the outpour that Jesus has for us if we just keep pouring it out, pouring it out in the way that we're not supposed to? So right now, everybody, let's lift our hands. Let's declare victory over this land. Right now, there's senseless crime, senseless wars going out there. You and move. the only way, you the only the way mountain. that we can move forward is to believe. move forward. I've seen to win again. You made a way. Let's do this way. Let's do a big show. We love when you. We thank no you, Jesus. Way. We are here, Father Jesus, God, oh Lord, Heavenly Father Jesus, God. You are the God of peace. You are the God of peace. And we'll crush Satan under your feet. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. Right now, we just declare victory over this land. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I'll see you move. You move the mountain. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it. bother singing about it if I didn't know he could I wouldn't bother wasting my breath on it but I tried him and I know him and he hasn't lost the battle yet and if I can go back into the pages of my life and see all the times God's been good to me and all those times the mountain could have been on top of me but instead, God moved it away. I can't help but be grateful. You know, they ask me, I, I think people wonder sometimes why I get so excited. It's because I just don't know how else to act. <laughs> you know, uh, when I get this excited, I'm going to put a locker in the back. So I can bang my head against it before I come out here. When I played football, man, I, I get so excited. I was looking for a locker to run my head into. <laughs> Just to calm me down a little bit. You know, they told me, uh, and, and I bring that attitude with me in the spiritual things. You know, when I played football, they told me, I played both sides of the ball. I played on defense and offense. I was a lineman both ways. Uh, I had muscles back then. And, you know, and I could actually do it back then. And I remember that somebody told me, you know, when you're on offense, you have to have a, a little bit different mentality, not so much aggression. And they said on defense, you got to be a little more aggressive on defense, Lorenzo. So I remember I was talking to my coach, and I told him that. I said, so when I'm playing offense, do I need to be a little calmer? And then on defense, be a little more aggressive? He said, well, who told you that? He said, all you got to know is whichever side of the ball you're on, there's somebody standing in between you and what you want. 
That's it. So if I was on offense, I was hunting you down. And if I was on defense, I was hunting you down. Because you were the only thing standing between me and what I want. And I don't know how sometimes we back off of our fight against the enemy. Just roll with the punches. I'm going to get tired of rolling with the punches. <laughs> I'm coming to hit back. <laughs> and if I could think of all the times that the enemy has put me on the edge of that spiritual cliff and push my head over and say that's where it's going to end but still here I am <laughs> still here I am <laughs> and you know there was even a time in my life Pastor John I didn't think I would preach again you know but like Jeremiah it's just like fire shut up in my bones <laughs> it's just like fire Glad you're here today. See you know, all the people and, um, you know, all these wonderful, um, we have people come far and wide. We got people from all the way from Pittsburgh here. Make the drive. I tell, I tell Grandma there, where do you want to sit? She says, where the fire is. <laughs> there ain't no back seat for me. I might as well get all I can. And if it's cold, jump around and praise God a little bit. You'll feel better. <laughs> if you're cold, it's because you want to be. <laughs> all right, enough of all that. <laughs> this is my last uh, sermon uh, of this series. Appreciate you, pastors, very much for allowing me this opportunity. Um, it has been a journey for me. Um, uh, I, I'm an older man now. I'm an older, younger man now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> they tell me age is just a number. I said, if that's true, then King Kong was just an ape. <laughs> how, does it, how does it feel to be 50? I said, I ain't there yet. I said, how does it feel to be 48? I said, 48? I don't know how it's supposed to feel. <laughs> Feels 48. <laughs> I know sometimes I get up and go, gets up and gone, it's gone, but, but uh, it has been a, a very great experience for me, guys, to, to speak this series. I've never done a, a, a four-week series of, uh, before. Um, I thought that when Pastor first told me about this many months ago, I had, uh, you know, like, you know, he tell me something, the thoughts just start going, and I had so much to talk about, and I was thinking, how am I going to preach four weeks? I'm not used to doing that, but actually, I could preach a lot more weeks if I if I had to because God just puts the you know, just keeps talking to you and and we've talked about these mountains as metaphors metaphors in our lives things that we've got to move you know things that are an obstruction and I think if we're all honest with ourselves we would know that there are things that are keeping us from getting where we want to get you know and, and, and it's about honesty and and it's and today's going to be Today's message was the one I had first. It's the first one that came to me. It was the one I was certain I was going to preach. And then all week long, I'm like, I don't want to preach that one. <laughs> you know, which means I got to preach that one because I don't want to. <laughs> you know, and uh, but I really think that God wants to move some major things in our lives today. And I think he wants to heal us. But here's the thing, but far beyond our flesh. Because a lot of times we ask for healing of our bodies. And God says, but if I can't heal the wounds you have inside that you've been carrying for so long, it don't matter how the body feels if the soul is in pain. And I think that's what God wants to do. This is going to be a dissection, an excavation today of our hearts so God can pull the wounds out of you that are keeping us from being whole. 
You know, that's the thing God told me. He says, here's the problem, Lorenzo, is they're serving me, and they're trying to serve me with half a heart. And it has nothing to do with effort or their desire. It has everything to do with the wounds they've not allowed to heal. So they're trying to serve me with all their heart, but all their heart just isn't there. And I want to heal those pains. I'm reading, and you're hearing Luke chapter 4. Verse 18, well-known scripture, should be, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Everybody has that achieves a particular platform or a runs for office, and have, they have a platform. They have an area of things they are going to address. If you make me president, I am going to do this, do this, do this. And they run on that platform. If I'm going to be the head of the team or whatever the case is, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And they go out and they run on that platform. Well, Jesus wasn't running for any type of office or position, but he did have a platform of specific areas he was going to address in his ministry. Remember, for what, for the, what purpose was God manifest in flesh, according to the Bible? To destroy the works of the devil. That's what he came to do. Not to fight the devil. Not to reason with the devil. But to destroy every work that he had done. To destroy it. So he says here, he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's one thing. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty from them, liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the year of the acceptable Lord. Notice two parts of that platform say this, to heal the brokenhearted, to heal the brokenhearted. And then again, he says it again. He says, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. See, a wounded soul doesn't just cause pain. It causes captivity. It doesn't just hurt. It holds you. And the Bible says, the day when they seek me with their whole hearts, they will find me. And so many times, I don't think we're finding God because we don't have whole hearts. I'm going to read this last verse here, and we'll get going. It says, and, and we're familiar, it's been our theme. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thy removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in their heart, but shall believe that those things which the, he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Today we're going to talk about <clears throat> the mountains of broken hearts <laughs> and wounds that never heal. Yeah. And how hard it is to truly live a full life when you carry wounds that just don't heal. <laughs> God wants to be a physician, a master physician today. Yeah. And heal those broken hearts. Jesus, we come before you. We thank you one more time. Bless the word. Bless those to hear. Help me do what I got to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> We've talked about mountains, you know, uh, the last several weeks. The, the metaphors they are, the obstacles they are in our lives. And, and we all have them. And if you live long enough or if you don't have any, either you're not being honest or you just haven't lived long enough. But they are going to come. And the mountains will come. The challenges will come. And one of the worst things we can do as, as, Christian, as Christians and as Bible-believing followers of Christ is to assume that the road is always going to be paved well. 
to assume that everything is going to be easy because, well, because God loves me <laughs> and Jesus loves me. Therefore, this road should be easier to set on. When in fact, uh, it, it's always amazing to me how when people come to the Lord, they feel like I've been uh, vaccinated against pain. <laughs> right? And that, that's, that deserves a laugh. It's like, because, you know, they tell me, oh, no, you can, all your troubles are going to go away. And it's like, okay, we'll see how that works. You know, it's kind of like that thing, is where that, that joke that says, how do you make God laugh? You tell him your plans, right? <laughs> yeah, God's like, ah, that sounds pretty good. Let's just get right on that. Let's just bless all those things you want and make it go. Let's just bless it. Let's just bless everything for you and make this an easy road to travel. Forgetting that oftentimes, blessing, and we've all been blessed, amen? Blessing is just a preclude to brokenness. A lot of times you are blessed so that you can be broken. Be yeah, Jesus did it all the time in the, in the Bible. I was talking to my wife about that the other night. I said, you know, the, when the guys were on the road to Emmaus, and we talked about this story briefly last time. I'm going to go slow because I want you to understand. You know, sometimes I, I, I think everybody knows the Bible. And they know everything I'm talking about. So what happened was Jesus was crucified. Two men, one was named Cleopas. The other one, we don't know his name. Seven miles away from Jerusalem, they're heading to a town called Emmaus. These two men are disciples. I said they mentioned one name. They never mentioned the other. They're walking on the road, and they're not in a very good way. They're pretty sad. They're pretty sad because just a few miles back, their Christ was put on the cross, and he was crucified, and he was killed. So on that journey somewhere between Jerusalem and Emmaus, a stranger appears, starts to talk to them, starts, hey, what are you guys so sad? They go, well, haven't you just heard? He goes, Jesus was, was crucified, you know. Everything that he said and did and all the things, were, all the people that were following, we, we just saw him get put on the cross. So this man starts to preach scripture to them, starts to talk to them. And the Bible says they didn't know, had no idea who he was. Had no idea at this time that that was actually Jesus that was speaking to them. Because the Bible says it wasn't holding of them to see. And I think that's an interesting topic in its own, how sometimes things are held from you until the time is that you need to understand them. Because the answer that they had and the victory they were seeking was actually staring in, into their face. But they had no idea of the victory because the Bible says it was not holding of him, of them to see it. There are times that God reserves the victory for the right moment. And it's already present. It just has not revealed itself. But as he continues to walk, the Bible says that Jesus wanted to continue to go on his journey. And, 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 and they, isn't that just like Jesus? He always wants to keep moving. They were a little bit tired. They didn't want to keep going. The journey had got them too far. So they get to a place, and I, I don't know if they had restaurants back then, but apparently they went to go eat somewhere. <laughs> they went and had some food. And when they get to the place to go eat, the Bible says that Jesus took out bread only. And when he took the bread out, he blessed the bread, and then he broke it. And that is the picture that I think we have to grasp sometimes, is that the, the road to our victory is going to come mostly through the brokenness. And a lot of times, God's initial blessing in your life is just to set you up so he can break the things in you that don't need to be there. Because there's a lot of times that there's things inside of us that we can't acknowledge because we've managed to bury them over time. And God's saying, I need the brokenness in you to open you up so I can see what is really hurting inside of you. Because if you let it fester long enough, if you let pain stay in there long enough, you forget that you're even hurting. And then you come into a place and you get into an atmosphere where God could actually answer your prayer, where God could actually do something for your life, where God could actually change a situation around, but you don't think you're hurt, so it bypasses you.
Was that Siri? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to give you a picture. And, and this one, this, this picture just, it, it just really touched, touched me. It said, on March 13th, 1933, no, I wasn't there to see that. Still took me a little bit while after that to get here. Sometimes I feel like I was there. Uh, March 13th, 1933, an apparent vigorous redwood suddenly toppled to its death, crumbling with a shattering clamor in a California forest. It ended 12 centuries of life, which was but an adolescent for a redwood who can in some cases survive four or five millennia. How you guys know that? A redwood could survive four or 5,000 years. Have you ever been around one of them? They're imposing. They're massive. Sections of the tree were preserved, and science, through the art and craft of tree ring chronology, opened a graphic autobiography of the tree's past. So, you know, the ring technology, uh, ring chronology is a study where they said they can go through, they can read through the rings, and they can actually determine certain histories and things that have happened in the tree's life. It tells the story. I even heard recently that they can actually, they can actually cut trees as, the, as, the, as a disc, like a record, and they can actually play the rings on a tree, and it plays music. Yeah. Look it up, it's on YouTube. Don't believe me. I'll make stuff up just to get your attention. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but what they started to determine as they read into the tree, they said here, it said somewhere during the dark ages, it was said to have endured a great earthquake and how the tree fought the effects of that awesome wound. Then sometime during the Renaissance, a fungus attacked the tree and for some time, the tree apparently fought the effects of the fungus. Sometime during the pilgrimage and the colonization of the eastern seaboard, lightning struck the tree. But once again, it fought off the effects of the wound. The rings revealed growth trends within the tree's life. And in one period of growth, the tree suffered through times of drought, storms, and stress. In one century of growth, it achieved growth of just eight inches. So in a whole century, it only grew eight inches. Very limited growth in that particular time. And its girth. And yet in another time, it achieved a 36 inch of growth in a single century. So the effects of its surrounding environment are actually determining the growth of this tree and its ability to battle its wounds. He said, there was a time of great storm and stress written within the rings of the tree, also centuries where there were no crisis or problems. But, and ain't that good, <laughs> when you have times of no crisis or problems, and we all said, thank you, Jesus. Doesn't happen that often. But we'll take them when we get them. It says, there were no crisis or problems. But in 1810, a careless Indian campfire burned a 13-foot scar on the northern side of the tree. Somewhat inconsequential and, insig and insignificant when you're looking at a tree that can stand 320 feet tall and weigh over 500 tons. So a 320-foot tree, 500 tons, a 13-foot scar does not seem all that significant does not seem like much. But the supporting roots of the north side of the tree were severely damaged. For over 120 years, the graphic, st the, the graphic story was within the rings of the tree on how it fought the effects of the wound. But it was a wound that never healed. Small, sometimes seemingly insignificant, but it never healed. So once quiet, one quiet spring, it didn't take much. They say it possibly was just the weight of a small bird. It could have been just the morning gust of the wind. And the tree came tumbling to its death. It fell 
to its death. Now, church, people, friends, family, we all have demarcations in our soul. We all have things in our lives that have affected us greatly. And we've all had things in our life that have hurt us. If God were to read the rings of our soul, what would he find? It would tell us that we've had periods of great spiritual growth, but it would also tell us that we've had periods of stagnation. We've had dark days and we've had wounds. And we've had things that have hurt us. And here's the thing. You can stand tall and you can stand strong for a time. <laughs> you can endure great pain for a time. You can, you can stand and behave like you're unaffected by what has transpired in your life. And believe and tell yourself that you've overcome. But if the wound has not healed, and if the wound is still tearing at your heart, the day will come where it's going to reach the source of your life. And it will topple you if you don't let it go. Hurts that are run deep. Hurts that you found a way to suppress. But they've affected you throughout your life. They have changed your countenance. They have seeped into the people you love. They have seeped into your ministry. They have seeped into your desire for God because you've let it fester. And God is saying, I want to remove the wounds of the bitterness, the wounds of the hurt, so you can live a life that is whole and complete in Christ. If you will ready, if you will note that most men, most nations, when they fell, it was always during a minor adversity that caused the fall. It was always something minor. It's not, the big giants are easy. You can see them. <laughs> They're easy, at least to identify. It's not hard to acknowledge the big enemies of our life. The big challenges are life. It's hard, it's hard to acknowledge the ones you can't see. I told you guys, I believe in week one, that the largest mountain they tell us is Mount Everest. But that's not true. That's only the largest mountain above sea level. It's the largest visible mountain. But the largest mountain in the world is actually mostly underwater. It can't be seen. The majority of it can't be seen. Jesus offered a description when he said this. Hmm. He said this, and the rain descended and the flood came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Matthew 27, 7, describing the fall. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you two stories and I got to hurry. I'm going to tell you two stories. I'm trying to be quick. Uzziah. And we're going to hit church hurt right now. <laughs> okay, We're going to hit it because it, it, when church hurt happens, it's the worst kind of hurt. Because we perceive God, the house of God and the people of God to be a place of refuge and strength. And when it turns to something other, it begins a wound inside of you where you can't even acknowledge the grace of God anymore. Uzziah was a king. The Bible says he was a teen. When he became king, what, 13 years old, when he ascended to the throne of Israel, and he reigned for 52 years, and most of that, according to the Bible, he did that which was right in the sight of God. For a majority of his life, he did that which was right in the sight of God. Let me tell you something. I don't care how long you've been serving God. I don't care how good things you've done for God, how many blessings you've been to other people. You've got to run it all the way to the end. 
It's got to go all the way. You cannot live on yesterday's blessings. You can't live on yesterday's praises. You can't live on yesterday's mercies. That's why God says they're new every morning. Because you spend up all that you got the day before. You got to keep moving all the way to the end. And as Christians, our faith and our passion and our desire has got to stand the test of time. You don't just wake up one day and say, I served the Lord. (laughs) You know, when Aaron was finally able to take off his priestly robe, his act of service, when he died. (laughs) Only time he was able to remove that, they took it off, and when he died, because... When you commit to the Lord and you give your life to God, the service and that blessing you've taken upon you, it is all the way to the end. There is no getting over this. (laughs) It amazes me sometimes. You see people are ready to save the world. And then a couple of months later, a year later, they've gotten over it. What'd you get over If the presence has come cold, it isn't because God has. It's how we respond to things. You know, because fire is fire is fire. But it will melt wax and it will harden clay. (laughs) I'll teach you on that for a little bit. Which one of those are you? (laughs) Does fire melt you? Does a difficult time put nothing but questions and fear and doubt? Or does it make you better? We're back to Uzziah. But time passed and Uzziah became careless and presumptuous. He was a king, king of Israel, Uzziah. If you don't remember anything, Uzziah. He was a king. He got careless though and he got presumptuous. He had been around a long time, and that can be a drawback. Oh, I've been here so long, I I already know. I tell you what, I mean, I learn things every single day. I preach things inside and out, and the next time I read it, I don't even know what I was talking about. I was like, God always reveals something new. but, But here's what Uzziah did. He got careless, and I want you to, I just want you Christian, God-loving people to listen to this. Just grasp this. Grasp this. He got careless and he got presumptuous. So he went into the holy place and he offered incense from the altar of God. And we know that these are sacred precincts, not for kings to do. For priests, not for kings. But he did it anyway. From the altar of God. And we know, and, and, um, and I'm not sure if it was the act or if it was his attitude. Because I know David did the same thing. He went and ate the showbread, but nothing happened to him. So I don't know if it was, I don't know for sure that it was the act or it was just the attitude on how he took the situation, got careless, just got careless with the things of God. So what he does is he partakes of the, he he, he likes, he does the incense and um, and God does this, he Regardless of whether it was the act or the attitude, God smote him with leprosy. And it was a small spot. It was a small spot that started on his forehead, and, but it began to gather momentum. And that's how it usually is. It's usually a small thing, but it will gather momentum. But because he was a king, his prerogative and his kingly prerogative, he was not banished to a colony of lepers, which was usual in that time. But instead, there was built for him a house just outside of the, of the, of the, of the house of his castle. The Bible says he dwelt the rest of his days in a separated house. But that is not the crisis of the story. The real crisis of the story is this, that Uzziah had a son by the name of Jotham, And one day in talking with him, the way that fathers should talk to their children, mothers should talk to the children. And I'll tell you what, if you are not spending time trying to pour your faith and the power of God into the people that are following you, then what are you spending your time talking to them about? (laughs) 
They're only going to get so far in this world. They can only get so much fame in this world. You can only get so much power and riches in this world. But you will have heaven for the rest of your life. And you will have the presence of God needed to structure you for the rest of your life. What is it that we tell them? Here's the problem is with Uzziah is in those conversations, Uzziah was preparing Jotham for leadership. And one day he crossed that unspoken line. Says, Dad, where did you get that spot? What happened to you? You know, and our children are smarter than we think they are. And they're listening closer than you think they are. And you can't profess God and then live like the devil. And think they're not going to catch on. He's like, Dad, where'd you get that spot? And his dad says, "Here's and and here's the challenge, you guys. And he says, I got it in the temple. I got it in the house. (laughs) Never acknowledged his carelessness. Never acknowledge his lack of attentiveness. But he he just tells them what he wants to tell them. I got it in the temple. You've got to be careful how you present the things of God in the church to your families. Because you're going to want them to embrace the power of God. But how do you talk about what happens in the church? And Jotham says, don't, don't, don't tell me you got that in the temple. I don't want to hear you got that in the temple. But here's the tragedy of it all. The Bible says that Jotham never for the rest of his life set foot back inside of that temple because he'd been poisoned by a toxic father that had a wound that never healed. Because our, our wounds don't just hurt us. That's the problem. There's decisions you make you didn't know you made. There's decisions people behind us made for us that we didn't make ourselves. And we're still paying for the hurts. And we're still paying for the pain. And every now and then we wonder why our minds and our physicalities don't ever get wholesome anymore. There's things that we've been chasing for years that we can't recover from. And it isn't because God is not able. It's because you still have a wound that hasn't healed. smile because I'll break the mood. It's heavy stuff. It's heavy stuff because this man's failures seeped into his son. And what this man did is he turned him away from the things of God because of the way he represented his own folly. And the worst part about it is his son never returned. And even worse than that, the Bible said he spent the rest of his days teaching Israel wickedness. (laughs) I'm just going to enjoy the quiet for a few seconds. (laughs) How many of you... um, Church, we, we do have to expect damage. Damage happens. We do have to expect that our lives will be challenged, that we will wind blown, we will be wind blown, and we will be storm torn. We will attract lightning. And you know why sometimes you know we attract the lightning? It's because we're fighting lions and bears and things that some people will never know anything about. Yeah. I said, God, when God blesses you to be broken, it's because he needs the brokenness of your heart to excavate the things in there that have been sitting so long. And that's what we think brokenness is a punishment. Brokenness is a process. 
You know, David never sings all them songs if he doesn't first say, purge me, Lord, with hyssop that I might be clean. Jacob never becomes Israel if he doesn't wrestle with the angel and get the thigh broken. You know, Peter never preaches that Pentecost message if he doesn't learn how to weep bitterly. And the room never fills with perfume if the woman doesn't break the alabaster box. Sometimes the blessing is in the breaking. <laughs> and how many times do we say that? How many times do we come to, or how many of you sincerely, and I'll say, I didn't even do it myself. I don't get on my knees and say, Lord, break me, please. <laughs> I say, bless me. I want the music to bless me. I want the preacher to bless me. I want the finances to be a blessing. I want the spirit to move and bless me. I want all these things to bless me. But I never ask God to break me. And then God says, that's the problem. You only learn one side of the coin. What I bless is for the intent to break. Because when I break it, it's when the most growth comes out of it. That's when the most power comes out of it. That's when the most change comes out of it. Bless me to break me. <laughs> I got 8.51 minutes. Your soul will reveal your battles, but it will also show how you handled it. You know, if God were to dissect the hearts and souls of us, it's not only going to show you what you've been through, it's going to show you how you handled it. Because the lesson comes in how you handle things. You relearn lessons you don't handle well. You ever wonder, how come you keep going through the same thing over again? You haven't handled it the way God wanted you to. <laughs> and you'll keep doing it again and again until you handle it the way God wanted to. You know, sometimes it's a little easy. You know, and you can even get wounded doing what's right. Just doing what's right. You know, when um, Paul was on the, on the island... After being shipwrecked, the Bible says that he's gathering sticks. And he's just gathering sticks around so he can make the fire, so he can warm himself. He's been shipwrecked. It's cold. It's wet. He's just trying to encourage the flames of the fire so that the people around him can enjoy a little bit of warmth. He does that. And what happens? A snake jumps out and bites him. <laughs> yeah. A viper bites him. And what does he do? He shakes it off. Sometimes the best thing you can do when something comes your way is just shake it off and keep on going. <laughs> can I ask you today, church, what is your story? We all have one. Somewhere, something, somebody did something they weren't supposed to do. Somebody left you and they weren't supposed to leave you. Someone hurt you. Someone didn't protect you. People you trusted did something they weren't supposed to do. And that wound just stayed and it's festered. The difference between all of us is not what happened, but how we heal and how we're affected by what did happen. There are no wounds big enough to silence what God has ordained for you. So understand that there is nothing big enough to stop the plan of God for you. No matter how much you've been hurt or wounded. Offense can become an instrument for God if you don't let it get you better. <laughs> was was uh, the Baptist, John the Baptist's major problem once he ended up in prison? Once he was calling for his life, what was his major problem then? It was offense. It was offense. It didn't happen the way he thought it was going to happen. And in the end of it, somehow God forgot him in the process. So he's starting to question whether Jesus is really the one. And how many people come to the Lord expecting God to do things a certain way when it did not happen the way they expected? They're asking now if they even should have come in the first place. So then John, and here's Jesus in his not so subtle way. John sends two people to go ask, go find out if he's the Christ or not. <laughs> And then Jesus says, ain't I doing what he said I'd be doing? 
Ain't I healing? Aren't the blind being able to see? Are people getting healed? Isn't that all happening? So what's the problem? It doesn't always work out the way we want it to. It doesn't. But sometimes our injustice has happened to us when we are doing right. And we're trying the best that we can. Let me tell you, Calvary, the blood of Christ is still the answer. It's still the answer. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He took the beating and the pain so you could transfer yours to him. I got I to gotta come to a close here. What another tragedy, another tragedy. David, and we all know about David. You talk about family issues, read the Bible. <laughs> talk about family drama. <laughs> well, you think you invented some of that stuff. Well, you didn't come close. <laughs> well, it was family drama, keeping up with the Davids. Well, that, sh- that show, that series would still be on, right? It never ended with him. He was always going through changes. So David was living in Hebron. And among his wives was Mecca. She was a Geshurite. Against advice, David ma- married a Geshurite. Geshurite was, they were warlike, vicious people. He still did it. David did a lot of things God didn't want him to do. You know, um, like take on many wives. You know, he did that too. So he took on Micah. She was a Geshurite. And he bore two children, Absalom and Tamar. At the time of the story, Absalom is 21 and Tamar is 18. They were beautiful, stately, elegant children, Tamar and Absalom. Even though Absalom was, according to the Bible, beautiful man. I didn't know there were beautiful men, but Bible says he was a beautiful man. <laughs> and so was Tamar. They were beautiful children. But another of his wives was a Hinoam, and she was a Jezreelite. And she bore him another son, and his name was Amnon. And the Bible says, with cunning counsel of a friend, that Amnon, through deceit, raped his own sister, Tamar. Now, if there's a wound that will fester like a knife in your heart, it's a sexual sin by a person you love. And Tamar was raped by Amnon, her own brother. Raped her, plotted it out. He was cunning. The Bible says he had a friend. You got to be careful what friends you're listening to. And he could, and, he, and they, they just, they, he raped her, violated her. And that day, and, and the day she was violated, her life was devastated. She was never given a marriage after that. She was never allowed to be a keeper of a home after that. She would never cradle children. And not because she wasn't capable, it's because the damage was so great she could never overcome what was ha- what had happened to her in time she probably learned how to live with it but when her brother heard her story he knew his dad would fix things he knew his dad would punish him like he deserved it was the right thing to do but david did nothing he did nothing Nothing to take care of this heinous act that Amnon did. So day after day, he watched carefully as his sister suffered the shame and how the wound in her heart tore her apart and how the beauty stripped her from her smile and stripped her from her joy and how this act slowly began to deconstruct her And Absalom was not going to have that. He was going to get vengeance on his own. It got into his heart. 
and the wound would not leave. So he bided his time and he bided his time and eventually the time came and he killed Amnon. But here's the thing. When the wound continues to fester and continues to take hold of your heart, that initial thing you thought would satisfy it won't do it. Because he kills Amnon and you think that would have satisfied him, but it would not do it. The Bible says that he left to go hide with his grand in his grandfather's house. And then they then they brought him back to Jerusalem to be where his dad was, and then he sought to kill his father. And here's the thing that just blows me away is in his attack on his father, 40,000 young men died while he was trying to kill his father. All because they were part of a battle that was not even theirs. And I wonder how many people suffer collateral damage because of things we have not got over. How many people have we marched into the mouth of the lion because we can't let our wounds heal? Because we can't let God caress our hearts and our souls and change the bitterness and the anger that still lives in there from something that should have been taken care of a long time ago. You know what they found in them trees? We were talking about them trees earlier. Is that when it recovers from damages, that it grows fibers in its roots that were stronger than they had ever been before. See, when you're able to recover from those pains that are deep within, it will build in you something that you didn't have before that battle started. If we look at it as God is trying to make me stronger, he's trying to make me stronger. Take your troubles to Jesus. When they found out that John was head was given in, given away, the Bible says that his disciples took his body and buried it, and then they went and told Jesus. So I tell you to do, don't hold that stuff in. Tell Jesus. Tell Jesus what it is. You can't get healed if you don't ever acknowledge to him that you've been hurt in the first place. Lay it down at an altar. Let the blood cover it. Job says he shall deliver thee in six troubles. Yea, in seven. There shall not evil touch thee. Psalms 92, 12 says the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. What's the difference between... What's the difference between a palm tree and a regular tree? The palm is different. Every other tree has its life beneath the bark. So that means when you girdle it or when insects bite into it because the life is right underneath the bark, it kills the tree. That's why sometimes life, simple situations are easy to get us down. But he says, be like the palm tree. A palm tree is different because its life is not at the surface, it's at the center. You can bend it, you can scrape it, you can scratch it, but it will prop back up because its life is in the center. I want to put my trust and my life at the center of him where all hell can't touch what has been given to me. It's time to bring your wounds and your pain to the altar of Jesus and put him in the center of your life where the devil can't touch. Okay, I promise I'm going to finish this time. <laughs> this is it. This is it. <laughs> that was a man. He was a great preacher. Very great preacher. And he'd been preaching for thousands of people for a long time. Great revivals. The flocks would come to hear him. But you know what? He said, there was a time in my life I was a rebel. I want nothing to do with the Lord. 
My dad was preaching. My mom was working in the house. All my family was loving the Lord. I wanted nothing to do with it. I was being the rebel. I was being a man, being a young man. I was sowing my wild oats. I was doing what I needed to do. He was, and he said, he got to the point. His brother was a very faithful Christian. My, he goes, my brother worked in the house. My brother did good. He prayed. He loved the Lord. He'd tell me, Dwight, you got to keep coming. Dwight, you got to get over this. Dwight, you got to you got to let it heal already. Whatever is bothering you, you got to get over it. You can't let it stay there no more. And he said that he just couldn't come around. He just couldn't come around. Then his the brother got really, really sick, and he died. Really, really sick. He said, it took me a while, but I finally turned my life around. And he said, but you know what? He goes, well, my brother got sick. We prayed and prayed that God heal him, and God never did. He goes, and in it, it developed a wound that I would not let heal. He goes, so I would preach revival after revival. Literally thousands of people that I knew needed healing, but I would never preach God as a healer. Never. He goes, no matter how much it tugged at my heart, I would not tell anybody God was a healer because God never healed my brother. And I wonder how many times we hold back a word of faith. We hold back a word of encouragement. We hold back something that could change somebody's life just because God didn't do it for you. So he said, I had to let it go. One day I was preaching. The tears started falling. He says, I couldn't hold it in no more. And he said, I want to tell you right now, God is a healer. He said, and I know he is because after 22 years, he's healed my broken heart. What is it that you're holding on to that still hurts you so much? Some of us have endured terrible loss, terrible pain. And you know what? It breaks your heart every day that you think about. God wants to pull that out. I can't preach no more. I'm done. You can stand. Wounds that never heal are a mountain that need to get moved. This altar is open to anybody here that needs a touch of God. Anybody here that needs help for your hurting heart, that needs help for your hurting soul.